Welcome, everybody. You are listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech presentation. My name is Ruben Saltzman, along with my co-host, Tessa Murray. We are the two-legged stool. Very wobbly today. There's there's no such thing as a two-legged stool, but that's what we are. We do not have Bill here today. He had something going on. He could not make it. And this is a retake. We tried recording this, and it was just not going well. So we're doing a retake, and then it wasn't working. So we said, you know what, Bill? We're going to have to leave you out of this one. I'm sorry. <laughs> so We miss you, Bill. We, we'll, we'll we miss try, you yeah. tons. We'll do our best without you. Yeah, it's it's not going to be the same, that's for sure. But, you know, we'll, we'll do what we can. And t- today we're recording part two of what to look for when you're looking at houses. We loosely titled this Showing Red Flags. And we called it that because we've got a CE class for real estate agents of the same title. But really, when we do our podcast, I think it's going to be a little bit more of a uh, kind of a sexier title or something a little bit more intriguing to get people to understand what this is about. And it's it's really it's what to look for when you're at showings, stuff you need to be aware of when you're going to showings. It's all those big red flags that would let you know, hey, I might be buying a bad house, right? Yeah. Or, or big expensive, you know, issues that need to be addressed. So yeah. Yeah. That's a better way of putting it. I like the way you say it. Maybe there is no such thing house. as a perfect house. Yeah. And we, we tell that to people all the time. And so it's just a matter of, you know, what are you willing to, to deal with and what can you afford to deal with? So hopefully this, uh, this podcast will help you identify some of these big potential expensive problems. Exactly. So what do we cover in the first one? I know we started on the exterior and we covered roofs, we covered chimneys, we talked about water management and looking at the roof and thinking about where the water goes and focusing on kind of those areas and, and siding a little bit too, right? Yeah, exactly. And we were going to finish with everything on the outside, but there's just too much <laughs> for even one podcast. We couldn't even get through all of it. So I think where we left off was on windows. Right. That's right. Yeah, we did. We left off on Windows. And should we just add to, for anyone that's listening that has questions, how do they get in contact with us, Ruben? Ooh, good point, Tessa. Go to podcast at structuretech.com. That's the email address. Shoot us an email, podcast at structuretech.com. Since we've been asking, I've been getting a few few more people sending in questions. I just had one person send me an email about, what is, was it? Heat pump water heaters. Asking about oh. heat pump water heaters. And I was thinking that would be a good one to discuss. Yes, it would be. I yeah. do not know enough about them to have an educated podcast. We'd have to find a good guest. We should okay. Do that. All right. Maybe I could get my neighbor on the podcast. We'll see. He's got one. Ah, so okay. So maybe we'll do that. Maybe a yeah. future show topic, but you got questions. Oh, and Tessa, we got yeah. to do one on Challenger electric panels. Yes, we do. Oh yeah. my gosh. How have we not already? I know. How have I not written about those? <laughs> We're teasing it. We're not telling yeah. you why this stuff is su- such good topics, but oh, we've got some good Stay topics. Stay tuned. Stay Don't tuned. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Sound effects. I, I've got sound effects with this new system we're using for podcasts, but I'm not going to try them again because it was a disaster last time I tried doing it. You know, maybe we should try them, Ruben. I think that sounds like a fun idea. Okay. Try a new one each podcast. All right. Are you ready for this one? Yes, I'm ready. Hit me. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> it was oh, the roll. Easy. All right. We're, uh, we're, we're turning into one of those wacky morning radio morning shows where they got the, you know, the air horn. And, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, should we get into it? If you're still listening, thank you for yeah. your patience, but we'll cut to the, cut to the chase now and get this into This is why we need Bill. Legs. <laughs> <laughs> we're just a couple of toddlers. Oh gosh. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All what right, Tessa, we we're on windows. If you're looking at buying a house, you you want to look out for obvious problems with windows. What what can people spot? Yeah, well, for the sake of this discussion, I think, you know, most people can look at a window and identify, okay, well, that window might be just at the end of its life. It's it's toast, right? But there's some things to pay particular attention to. And you know how we discussed focusing 
kind of looking for problematic areas, areas that are going to fail first. And you, you know, you look at the roof line, you think about where the water is going. If it's shooting off the roof, hitting the side of the wall, that could be a potential area for failure, right? And so same thing goes for windows that stick out, you know, beyond the wall and bump out windows or windows that don't have any overhangs and have a lot of exposure. Those are the windows that potentially are going to rot first. So when you're looking at a house, take a look at those windows first and also take a close look, you know, if it looks like they've been patched and painted over, you know, give it a gentle push or touch just to see, you know, if it's solid or if it's rotted there as well. Yeah, good advice. And and on that, as far as touching your windows, one that I'm always on the big lookout for is windows, I'd say right around the 90s maybe up through early 2000s, they had a lot of these aluminum clad wood windows. So if you're buying a house where you think the windows may have been put on sometime around that era, look out if it looks like an aluminum window, There's, it's probably not aluminum. It's probably aluminum clad wood where they just cover the wood with aluminum. And so often you can go up to those windows, you just push on the aluminum with your thumb and you realize there's nothing behind it. The wood is rotted apart to nothing. And th there's usually no visual evidence of that. That's the unfortunate part. So it's a matter of just going up to a few windows, like you said, that have the most exposure and giving them a little push. Or maybe if you're feeling really ambitious, go to a couple of windows and just crank them open. And so often we'll crank open windows that look just fine on the outside and the crank arm just falls apart and <laughs> it's connected to just about nothing. Yeah. Sawdust. Yep. On the bottom part of the window. Yep. I will add too, don't be scared off by wood windows that have some staining on them too. We see a lot of wood windows that have, you know, staining from moisture and condensation. And so give those windows a poke too. And if it feels solid, you know, a lot of times you can just sand that off and, and refinish them and they're, they're fine. Well, that, that is a great point, Tess, because I, I think I've shared it on this podcast where the house that I live in now, the windows looked horrible. They were mm -hmm. all original wood with like, I don't know, they, they, they were stained and somebody didn't control their humidifier and they didn't run the HRV. So there was way too much moisture in the air and all these windows in my house were stained black. But for the most part, they were still in very good condition. They just looked horrible. And I think it scared the daylights out of people who were looking at this house and it never sold. Mm -hmm. And for wow. me, I went around and it was just like, hey, these windows are fine. I, I'm mm -hmm. going to hire someone to sand them and paint them. And they look like new today. Yeah. So yeah, yeah black stains are not a big deal. They just look bad. Yeah. It's only a big deal if it actually rots your window. Yeah, yep. windows are windows can be such a big expense for people if they need to replace all the windows. I mean, tens of thousands of dollars. And so there's a lot of things you can do, I think, to kind of repair or improve your windows that don't involve replacing them completely. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So next, I think we're going to dive into decks. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Well, we, uh, we've got so many pictures of deck defects in our database, don't we, Ruben? I mean, just probably just even thousands, I would say. It, it feels like more <laughs> about decks than just about anything else. And most of the stuff, you really need to see the photos to appreciate it. So we can't do a deep dive into what to look for if you're buying a house. I mean, we're talking about the stuff that people should just be able to spot that you don't need a home inspector for. So the stuff that we're going to talk about, number one, is just looking at your deck from a distance and making sure everything is plumb and level, making sure you don't have sagging going on in the middle of the deck, making sure that everything looks the same. I mean, I, there's, there's a deck I drive by every time I leave my house and it's like, it's two blocks away. I can see it through neighborhoods, but I can see that it, it has experienced frost heat. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a phenomenon in, in cold weather climates where the ground freezes and it pushes the footings up and it actually raises sections of the deck. And there are decks around my area that are, that have experienced that and you can see it from blocks away but sometimes if you're standing right underneath it you may not notice it it's it's one of those macro things you need to see from a distance yeah and and i think one of the biggest things we look at as home inspectors is is the deck attachment to the house too and and you know does it look like it's been bolted on securely is it just nails or do they have you know proper attachments there is there flashing at that ledger board and those sorts of things but you know as we're not going to get into that level of detail the main thing that i'd say you can look for if you're you know um buying a house with a deck is is there any rotted wood? You know, does any yes. of the structure, the framing of the deck, the joists, the beams, the posts, you know, the 
deck boards themselves is anything rotted. And decks have, what would you say? Like I, I've heard, you know, anywhere around a 20 year lifespan. What would you say? Yeah, about- de- depends on what they use. You know, yeah. cedar is probably going to have the shortest lifespan. Pressure treated wood is going to last longer and composite will last even longer. Now yeah. we're talking about the deck boards, of course, mm-hmm. for the framing. All we ever see is pressure treated wood, right? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, every once in a while you'll see like an LVL or something, but those are a rare exception. Every once in a blue moon, I'll see yeah. steel used on the outside at a deck and it just it freaks me out a little bit. I'm going to be yeah. honest. It seems weird to see steel on a deck, but yeah. Like you said, make sure that there's no rot. Take the time. Get your flashlight like we told you to get in episode one of this podcast and go underneath the deck and look at the joists. If you're not taking the time to do that, you could be missing something really big. Mm -hmm. We've seen decks where people have completely replaced all the deck boards, but they left rotted joists in place. And and on that for deck boards, look out for painted decks. I, Mm. I don't think anybody ever paints a deck that's in good condition. <laughs> it's like our tip we just said with windows. It looked like they might have been patched and painted over. Give it a poke. See if your finger goes through the de- through the paint and through the deck board. <laughs> yes, yes. And 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 look at guardrails. I mean, I I'll tell you. I think one of the worst designs for a deck guardrail is where you have aluminum balusters going mm-hmm. into wood top and bottom rails. I hope you can picture that. We're talking aluminum balusters, aluminum rails. And then the top and bottom rails that the aluminum connects to is going to be wood. And the Mm -hmm. problem is that there's no way to stop water from traveling down the aluminum and then getting into the wood. And man, do those things rot. So so look out for those. That's another thing I did. I bought a house that had those. Probably one of the biggest defects with this house that I knew about when buying. And I just thought, I'm going to have to replace all these guards. And it was a lot of guards. I was going to say, and it was way more expensive than you thought, wasn't it? How Can you give us a ballpark of what to expect for replacing guardrails? It it was, although luckily I, I asked... A contractor, what it was going to cost me before yeah. I did it, and let, let me let me do a little bit of quick math here. I think it ended up being about one hundred dollars per lineal foot oh my gosh. of wow. guard. Yeah, yeah, that, that's about right. Yeah, it was about a hundred bucks per lineal foot. So that's crazy. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. And that's, is that, was that for a, just a kind of a standard guardrail? We're not talking glass or metal or anything like that. Nothing super fancy. I ended yeah. up, I ended up going with aluminum. You know, it was, it was a fairly inexpensive version of aluminum. I think it looks really nice. It's aluminum at the top and bottom. And I mean, it's, it's 100% aluminum. And I think we got them from Menards. We ordered them and I hired a contractor to do it mm-hmm. all. And yeah, that's, that's about what we ended up paying. It wasn't anything crazy. It, it probably would have been less expensive had we simply gone with standard pressure treated lumber, but I'm not into doing that. I'm not into cedar yeah. either because I don't want to have to stain it. I want yeah. to, I want to just put free. it in and be done. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. I so watch you. out for guards. They, they can yep. be surprisingly expensive. Yeah. So just a quick recap on the decks. The biggest thing is just take a walk around from a distance, right? And look at that deck from a distance. Does it look level, plumb, square? Do you see any visible signs of rot, deterioration, or guardrails loose? And then hire a home inspector to do the rest. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Exactly. (laughs) Okay. Well, what's next? What's after decks? Next, we're moving on to the structure of the house, and we'll talk a little bit about foundations. We get a ton of questions about foundation problems. It's one of the things that freaks people out the most. And, you know, we've, we've seen our share of nasty foundations, but more often what happens is that you have hairline cracks, typical settlement cracks. And I, I know we had Rob Vassallo on, I don't know how long ago, and he insisted yeah, there's no such ago. thing as a normal settlement crack, but, yeah. uh, but still, I'm going to call them settlement cracks. I mean, foundations do crack and yeah. it's not a big deal. Typically, our our general rule is if you have a concrete block foundation and you got cracks that are less than a quarter inch, probably not a big deal. If you've got poured concrete, if they're less than one eighth inch, probably not a big deal. So it, we're we're looking for stuff larger than that. And you know, mm-hmm. when I say general rule, there's always exceptions. I mean, mm-hmm. if you've got a small crack in concrete block and it's been patched and it has opened up again since, 
I'd be more concerned. It tells me that somebody knew about it, they tried to do something about it, and it's actively moving, it opened up again. I'd be more concerned about that. Mm -hmm. And also, we're concerned about long horizontal cracks. Those can be a bigger deal, and it's usually the result of pressure against that foundation. And, you know, it your walk around the outside is probably going to tell you where you're most concerned. It's probably going to be areas where you have poor water management. You've got the ground pitching in towards the house, maybe a driveway that slopes yeah. towards the house and then vehicles park there. There's additional weight and maybe no gutters or you have gutters and you've got a downspout discharging right next to the house. Those are typically areas where we see foundation problems. Yeah, definitely. Water management is key and grading and like you said, driveways that are right up against a foundation too. That's where we see the most failures for foundations. But one other thing I just wanted to add to this discussion is so many houses have finished basements. Mm, and yeah. if you're buying a house with a finished basement, there's just so much you cannot see. I mean, you, you can't see the foundation. You won't be able to see, you know, any uh, plumbing, electrical, HVAC stuff it's, if it's finished in the ceiling. And Personally, I am a huge fan, and I've said this on many podcasts, of unfinished basements. Um, <laughs> for not only for you know reducing your risk of mold and moisture and 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 problems in finishing these basements, but just for being able to inspect the rest of the house and the structure of it too. Yeah, so, yeah. We that's where Tessa and I we we butt heads just a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I love the finished basement, but I, I am with you. It is a lot scarier when you got a, a finished basement. There's yeah. so much more that can go wrong and it can take a long time to find out about it. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to see, hard to detect these problems potentially. But, you know, we do have some examples of pictures in this class showing red flags of foundations where they are finished on the inside, but there's a little bit of foundation that's exposed above grade. And we've got some pictures of foundation walls that are bowing and they're caving. And you can kind of tell that actually from just sighting down the side of the house, looking at that small portion that's visible above grade. So that's something you can do is just look at the foundation that is exposed and look at the condition of that. And, you know, we have a lot of older houses too in this state that have like stacked stone foundations and, you know, is there missing mortar or, you know, some crumbling stones in areas to that need maintenance. And if that's the case and it's finished on the inside, then you can bet that, you know, there's more areas that are of concern that are hidden too. Yeah. And let me, let me just kind of repeat what you said, because that's such a good point Tess, And we are in 100% agreement there is that if you've got a stacked stone foundation, you ought not finish that basement. If the basement yeah. does get finished, there's no way for those walls to dry to the inside. And that's how they're designed. They're supposed yeah. to dry to the inside. And what you end up with is water at the base of your walls. You end up with a damp basement. You end up with mold issues and deterioration of the base of your walls. I mean, there's so much that goes wrong. So I would be very, very concerned about any house with a stacked stone foundation and any portions of that basement are finished. Yeah, that's, that's a huge red flag. Yeah, yeah that, in general. That creeps yeah. me out. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. And, you know, it, if it looks pristine and it looks perfect, great. But uh, to me, that says it's probably been recently refinished. And it's only a matter of time before it gets wet again. Yep, yep. You're probably right. We are such pessimists, but... We're, we're basing this on experience. Experience. Look for fresh paint. I mean, I don't know if that's in your, if I'm skipping ahead, Ruben, stop me if I am. But another red flag in basements is like anything that's been freshly painted or like sometimes if a basement has new paint and new carpet, new tack strips and everything, and you can tell on the outside, the grading is really bad and there's no gutters and no downspouts. Like that's a red flag in and of itself. Yep. Yep. Agreed. And you know, let's just, let's just take that uh, to move on to wet basement issues. We're, yeah. we're going a little bit out of order on what we plan to talk about, but I mean, as, as long as we're on that, yeah. it, it, when you're doing your walk around the outside, if you see areas where a lot of water is concentrated, those are the areas where you want to focus your efforts on the basement, looking for any signs of water intrusion, if it's all finished. And you do that by looking at the base of walls. What are we looking for? What are the 
signs yeah. that you had water. Like, you, you know, you can look for um, stains on if you've got like wood door frames in the basement, look for staining on the base of those door jams or, you know, baseboards. If you've got more finished areas down there to look for staining at the bottom of the baseboards. And if you can, you might even be able to pull up a little bit of carpet in a corner to take a peek at the tack strip underneath. And if that tack strip is black or rotted or deteriorating, that's a good sign you've had, you know, water intrusion. You know, it's not that big of a deal to pull back a little corner of carpet. If you're pulling back several feet, that carpet is probably going to get messed up and it's going to need to be restretched. But we can usually, even without even pliers, you can usually use your fingers, just peel Mm -hmm. back a little corner to see maybe an inch or two of the tack strip. And you can kind of tuck it back down underneath the baseboard trim. If you, I mean, you're not going to have a screwdriver with you, but you can use a car key. The, if your car the old uses car a key. key, yeah, <laughs> the old car key, yeah, not the new key fob, <laughs> but you can use usually, usually yeah. use that to tuck it back under the baseboard trim, and nobody's yeah. ever going to know you peek. Yeah, with finished basements, I think one thing we skipped over a little bit talking about wood foundations. Mm, yeah. Do you want to talk about that, Ruben? So wood foundations are not common in Minnesota. I mean, I want to say surely less than 1% of homes have a permanent wood foundation. But for the ones that do, a lot of them have water problems. And a lot of the time, people don't even know that they have a permanent wood foundation. I mean, they'll fill out the disclosure form and they'll they'll check the box for concrete foundation or poured mm-hmm. concrete foundation. And it's not. It's wood. They just don't even know. And so it's, it's kind of a big deal if you got one of those, because if you do, you're going to want to have specialized testing done to make sure that you haven't had water intrusion and that things aren't bowing in and everything is still plumb and level and dry. That's surely the biggest concern with permanent wood foundations. And I'm not saying this to say you shouldn't buy one of these houses, but if you're going to buy one, you definitely want a specialized inspection on it. Yeah. They, I mean, it's, the concern is exactly what it sounds like. You're you're putting wood and you're burying it in wet soil and that's what's holding up your house. So if that wood gets wet, you can imagine major structural concerns and a lot of money to repair that. Yep. Another thing to, to look for too is in slab duct work. And I know we've talked about this on the podcast before. Yeah. Um, a lot of people use the term, they confuse the term transite duct work with in slab duct work and transite duct work is is specifically talking about an asbestos type of duct work and there are ducts in slabs that are made of transite material but not all of them and so we're really careful to you know to not call something transite uh, duct work if it's not a lot of times we'll see pvc or plastic or maybe metal or there's other materials out there too but cardboard are, yes cardboard what is that called sauna tube sauna tube yeah yeah sauna tube i can't believe they use cardboard and concrete and then oh my gosh anyways yes. Yeah, that that would be a huge red flag. But anytime you've got ductwork in a slab, there's a potential for moisture building up in that slab, either through condensation or through moisture coming through the slab itself and Mm -hmm. basically flooding that ductwork. And so what we like to do as inspectors is pop off, you know, a floor grate, a register cover, and take a look inside that ductwork with a flashlight. So we're looking for any, you know, lines or or staining that water would have left behind if it sat in that ductwork and then dried or sediment or sand or silt that's been left behind from that standing water too. And usually I would say probably like more than half of the time you will find some signs that that duct has had water standing yeah, in it. Yeah, completely agree. And and just to be clear, so you, you so you know what Tess is talking about when she says in slab ducts or sub slab ducts. Basically, if you go down in a basement or you've got a slab on grade home and you look at the concrete floor that covers the dirt, and you've got heat registers coming out of there, it means you've got sub slab duct work. Yes. That's, thanks that's for your, clarifying that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's a concern that there's water in there. If it's all been dry and there's no signs of problems, fine. You don't need to do anything. Yeah. And I mean, the, the solution for that, if you do have, you know, in slab duct work, you try to correct the water management issues on the exterior of the house. But we've seen plenty of houses where they've done that and they still have a problem. And so the reason we're talking about that now is a potential big red flag is because it could mean like the solution could be moving that duct work up into the finished space of the house, relocating it. Yeah. And as you can imagine, that's not going to be cheap. 
No, no, there's a lot involved in that. Yeah. yeah. Unless you're okay with, you know, the wa- the air that you're breathing running through moldy, nasty water. Nobody's okay with that, Tess. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, you know, built-in humidifier. Yay. <laughs> yeah, built-in humidifier. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, I we could make a collage of just all of the c- disgusting things we find in slab duct work, right? Oh, I've I've got one. Yeah. Absolutely. Mice, yep. bugs, spiders. They're Anyways, right. okay. Yeah. People get the point. And sub yep. doctor can have some problems with it. Yeah. So moving on, we'll we'll talk about plumbing a little bit. And you know, for plumbing, it's a little bit easier. When you're buying a relatively new home, we don't find a lot of problems with plumbing. It's it's more of an older house thing. And the, and the stuff to really look out for is galvanized water distribution pipes. Those are the pipes throughout the inside of the house and galvanized drains. Both of those can lead to kind of expensive problems. And they were using galvanized pipes up until around 1960 or so, there was kind of a transition period between about 1950 and 1960 where they started using other materials. If it's before 1950, it's almost a guarantee. You're going to have galvanized drains and galvanized distribution pipes unless someone has taken the time to go through and replace them. And the problem with those is that they corrode on the inside. The diameter gets smaller and smaller, and it means that your drains just don't drain. Or if somebody has been trying to fix it the wrong way, they've been pouring acid down their drains, or excuse me, Drano down their drains, and they've been ruining their drains. Or with distribution pipes, the concern is that you get less and less water flow to the point where you can't do two things at the same time. So like you can't shower and and have your dishwasher running at the same time or yeah yeah, yeah. or or do laundry and you know what what we do for home inspections this is not a big deal to do it's just turn on a high flow fixture like turn on the laundry faucet in the basement and then try turning something on at the highest level of the home and make sure that you still have acceptable water flow anybody can do that you don't need to be a home inspector to do that simple yeah. little test Oh, that is such a good tip. Yeah, if you're buying a house 1960 or earlier, we encourage you to do that little simple test. Turn on a fixture in the lower part of the house and then run upstairs and turn on a shower or something like that. And worst case scenario, you know, we've, we come across this a lot in older houses that have that original plumbing where you turn on the shower and nothing comes out or yes. just a few drops of water come out. Yep. And yep. It, it could also indicate a problem with your water main. What's, what's coming in from the street into the house. I think we just recently did a podcast about that. Yeah. And the problems are with either galvanized steel or with lead. Those can lead to poor water flow. And also with lead, you got a concern over the drinking water quality. Yeah. Yeah. Which, so if, you know, so that's another potential red flag. If you're buying a house that has original water supply line that's galvanized or lead, um, that would be found in a house that's what, 1920s and earlier in Minneapolis and St. Paul. There's a chance it's original unless someone has replaced it, which is expensive, but can happen. You can also check with the waterworks department, right, Ruben, um, yeah. for historical records on the property to see if that water supply line's ever been replaced by a previous owner. Yeah, it depends on the city. If you're in Minneapolis, you got to give them a call. If you're in the city of St. Paul, they actually have a lookup feature. That this is a fairly new thing, and you can yeah. search right online, and it tells you what type of plumbing they have bringing water into the house. Super helpful information. Yes. That's a great tip. You know, I was going to say back to the galvanized, if someone's wondering what that looks like, I know you've written several blogs about galvanized, you know, water distribution pipes and drain pipes. People can Google that, find the blogs, read about it more. But if you're just, you know, if someone is is looking for quick tips on how to identify it, how would you describe it? I'd say for the piping coming in, it's going to be the stuff coming up from the floor. What you want to see is either copper, and hopefully you can you can figure out copper when you see it, or plastic. Those are the two modern materials. If it's something else, it's going to either be galvanized steel or lead. If it's galvanized steel, you'll have a threaded connection. If it's lead, you will have something called a wipe joint, where it it looks like it's this big ball of, of metal. It's a big ball of lead. Now, that wipe joint could be installed on copper too. So it's not a a telltale sign that you've got lead, but it would make you question it at least. Yeah. And another reason why I like unfinished basements, so you can see what type of plumbing we have in the house, right? Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. 
Okay. Moving on. Drains are another big thing too in sewer lines. And, you know, we started offering sewer inspections at Structure Tech. How many years ago was that? I'd say it was about six years ago. Okay. About six years ago. And and it's just blown up. It's huge now, right? Yeah. We do it. Almost 50% of the houses that get a home inspection get a sewer inspection. That's right. Now. So and and we encourage anyone that's that's buying a house, old or new, to get their sewer inspected because we found that even new houses have problems with sewer lines. With the plastic during construction, heavy equipment can run over it. And if the dirt's not compacted properly, it can cause damage or dipping or sagging in the pipes too. So we've got plenty of videos and reports of failed sewer lines in houses that are 10 years older or newer. So we do, we recommend sewer inspections on any age house. Yes. Yes. And we're going to talk a lot more about that in next week's podcast. We're going to have Ishvan Jaco on and we're, we're talking all things sewer inspection. So we'll, we'll, we'll fill you up on those next week. That's awesome. Little, little teaser. All right. So moving on, we'll talk a little bit about appliances. Probably the, the best thing you can do for your appliances, like the water heater, the furnace, the air conditioner, is just figure out the age of them. Figure out if they're really old. That's the best piece of advice I could give you. Uh, I'll share with you a website that every home inspector in the country either knows about or should know about. <laughs> and it's building hyphen center dot org www.building-center.org and they've got a very nice site where you you type in you, you look up the make and some of the model number and they will interpret the age of that appliance for you so mm -hmm. I, w whatever you're looking at use this site to help guide you and if mm -hmm. if you're at a house you're just not sure you want to look it up later take a picture of the model and the serial number the data tag and look it up later. That's that's the best advice I can give you on appliances. A lot of times on the water heater, you can just look at the, the tag. It's visible, you know, if the water heater is not covered in insulation or blanket or something. But on a furnace, it might be a little bit more difficult. Most times the, the data tag is on the inside of the furnace cover. So if you're comfortable yeah. doing that, can pop off the cover and take a picture of that data tag and then pop the cover back on. Yeah, good point, Tess. And most of them you don't need tools for. Sometimes yeah. you have little thumb screws you can take off with your hands. Every once in a while, you have furnaces where you actually need a screwdriver. You probably wouldn't want to be doing that during a showing, <laughs> <laughs> but but for most yeah. furnaces, you can easily pop the cover off without any tools. Yep. And same thing with the AC unit. You know, if the house has central air, look at the, the data tag on the AC unit on the outside. And sometimes it's really close, close to the ground level on the very back. So you might need to crawl on your hands and knees and, you know, stick your head underneath it to look. But um, you can usually pull that off of the unit pretty easily too. Yeah. And it, it is rare that units do not have a data tag. I've, yeah. I've been, I, I've done many a home inspection where I'm training a new inspector and they come back to me and say, this one doesn't have a data tag. I looked all over. It doesn't have one. And I go, let's take another look. And I always find it. It's like, you just got to get down on your knees. You got to look a little bit harder. You got to get in the most awkward, inconvenient posture possible and you'll find it. Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. All right. Moving on. We'll talk a little bit about electrical. And now, I mean, there's so much that can go wrong for electrical, but we're really looking for the big stuff. So there's a handful of big, expensive things that we're looking for. What's Oh, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but Ruben, what should we tell people is a concern, like a red flag in terms of age for appliances? Because they're going to get the age, but then they're going to say, well, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. All right. For water heaters, I'd say... You know, it, it really depends on where you are. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're in Bloomington, you might have a water heater last 30 years. If you're where I live in Maple Grove, maybe seven <laughs> years. <Yes. laughs> seven, yeah. Uh. So it, it's really dependent on, upon the water quality where you live. But I mean, on average, we go with about 10 years is a good life for a water heater. Maybe yeah. 15 is really pushing it. And we're talking about just like a standard tank water heater. Like, you got it. Yeah. And we're not talking about the really big tanks, 100 gallons, and we're not talking about on-demand water heaters or anything like that. Yep. Yep. Just your traditional tank water heater. And then for furnaces, air conditioners, somewhere around 15 to 20 years is a good life. Boilers, you should be able to get at least 30 years out of a boiler. And that surprises some people like boilers, 30 years. A lot of times we, you know, you see boilers that are much older than that, yes. but in general, 30 years is kind of the average life expectancy. Exactly. 
Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to throw that out there no, for thank people you. that are thank looking you. at their their appliances and wondering, you know, okay, well, what's expected out of this? So, okay, so you were moving on to the electrical aspect here. Yeah. What were we going to talk about with electrical red flags? Well, first, let's talk about a couple of the bad panels. Okay. One of them is buying a house that has a Federal Pacific Electric Stab Lock Panel, or F. P-E. Those are bad panels. They start fires. The breakers don't trip when they should. They should all be replaced. So you'd be looking at the main electric panel and you'd be looking for the letters FPE or Federal Pacific Electric or Stab Lock. Any any of those words means you got a panel that ought to be replaced. And you know it's probably going to cost a couple thousand bucks to have an electrician come in and swap it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, what age house are you most likely to find these panels in? I dug through the last 100 panels that we've found at Structure Tech. And out of all of them, it looks like we had 79 of those 100 were in houses built in the 70s and 80s. Okay. So wow. that's, that's really where you'll find most of them. 70s and yeah. 80s is where you find stab locks. Yep. And maybe if you've got an, like a much older house and someone replaced a, an old panel with something in the seventies, then you could find it in a really old house potentially, but. Yep. Yep. Okay. Exactly. And then an, another brand of panel that you want to look out for is one called Zinsco or Sylvania. And this is one where you've got a bunch of really thin breakers stacked on top of each other. And they usually have colorful, colorful handles like you have green and blue, mm -hmm. blue and red. Yeah. Zinsco or Sylvania. Those, those are bad panels too. Those should always be replaced. And we're not going to talk about challenger panels today. Are we Ruben? You we are not talking about challenger. That? What, okay. what I will say for the T's is that we have no stinking problem with those. <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. Oh, yeah. I'm 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 whipped up about these tests. I am whipped <laughs> up. I'm telling you. But we'll come back to that later. Okay. Well, I know there's a few things that we look for too in terms of just like wiring in houses that could be a potential red flag. And you're showing a picture right here. We can see it of knob and tube wiring. And knob and tube is kind of the first generation wiring. And you know we've we've seen it in houses up until 1920s. I think the oldest house I've ever seen it in was like 19 like late 1920s. I, I haven't seen anything older than that. Have you? Have you seen it in houses in the 30s or 40s? Yeah, yeah I think you can have 30s and 40s. It's not can as you? common. Definitely okay. not as common, but it, it yeah. could be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's something to look out for. And, you know, you identify that knob and tube wiring by, well, the look of it. You've got porcelain knobs, white knobs, and then you've got, you know, this cloth thick kind of black wiring too as well. And so a lot of times, you know, if we're in a basement, it's unfinished. That's a good place to start looking for that knob and tube wiring. And the problem with knob and tube is that, you know, over time, this this system, it's not designed to handle kind of the loads that we have today. And you can't update this type of system with GFCI outlets or anything like that. There's no ground wire. It's just a two wire system. And so that in general is, is one of the concerns. But another thing is too, if that cloth insulation disintegrates or comes off the wire, then you're left with these, you know, bare wires that if you touch them, you could get shocked or electrocuted. And they're meant to be free air to not be buried in insulation or touching anything. And so a lot of times when we go into a house that's a hundred years old and has the original knob and tube wiring, it's been modified somehow. It's been spliced together with Romex or it's been buried in insulation in the attic. And those are reasons for concern. Those are yep. potential fire hazards. Yeah. And, and besides all of that, insurance companies hate it. Yes. We, we did a survey a couple of years ago asking probably about 30 insurance companies, will you insure a home with knob and tube wiring? And most of them just flat out said, no, we will not insure it. So wow. th that, that could be a big concern too. You know, I'm wondering like what in, in, in the real world, what are people with knob and tube wiring doing then? Because there are so many houses in the Twin Cities that still have knob and tube in use, you know, in some portion of their house. The insurance company doesn't know it. That's what it comes down to. Yep. I'm, okay. I'm sure of it. Yep. Yeah. There are, I mean, there really are a lot of houses in the Twin Cities that do have knob and tube stuff, yep. you know. Yep. And then another type of wiring, probably one of the, the worst ones that we find. And I mean, on this one, I've got countless photos of scorched and melted wires with where you've got aluminum branch circuit wiring. 
And we're not talking about the wires that go directly from the panel to an appliance, like wires that go to your dryer or air conditioner or things like that. that that's, that's not branch circuit wiring. We're talking about the stuff that goes to your outlets, your lights, your switches. If that stuff is aluminum, and they, they used it from about, I don't know, 1965 up through about 75, somewhere in that mm-hmm. range. If you've got aluminum wiring there, that's a huge concern. If I'm, if I'm looking at a house that's built in that age, that's one of my biggest concerns. Does the house have aluminum wiring? And it's really tough to figure that out. If you're, if you're really lucky, you may be able to look down at the main electric panel and you might be able to see some wires coming out that are labeled aluminum. It actually mm-hmm. says aluminum on the wires. Short of that, really the only way you're going to figure it out is by having the panel cover removed. Yeah. So I, th- there's not much you can do during a showing to figure out whether or not you've got aluminum wiring. I think the biggest thing is if if you're just buying a house from the mid 1960s to the mid 1970s or even like late 70s, I've seen a house with aluminum brand circuit wiring that was like 1978. Just be aware that that could be present, and I think it's reason to have either an electrician or a home inspector come in to verify that. Exactly. You might have mentioned this, but did you say like how much of a risk it is for fire? With aluminum? It's, it's probably the biggest thing that we see when it comes to electrical. I don't know of a yeah. bigger concern. I, I, I just, we've got so many photos of problems. I mean, you know, Federal Pacific stab lock panels, the concern is those things start on fire or wires start on fire. I don't have a huge library of photos of melted bus bars and melted breakers, but I do have that when it comes to aluminum wiring. Yeah. Yeah, I think, isn't there some research that was done? Was it Franklin Research Institute or something that said basically like aluminum branch circuit wiring is like 55 times more likely to catch fire than than your copper, your standard copper? You know your statistics, Tessa. Well, that's because you've taught me well, Ruben. Well, and it's in those classes we teach for real estate agents. You know, we share that information with real estate agents so that they're aware of, you know, helping their clients with what they're buying and looking for these potential, these problems. So yeah, it's definitely something to be cautious of. And and the double whammy is when you get a, a Federal Pacific Electric panel from a house built in 1970 that also has aluminum brain circuit wiring in it. Oh, no bueno. Yeah. Not good. Not good. Well, there's another another thing to look out for too. What about old fuse panels? Yeah, that's another one too. A lot of insurance companies don't like fuse panels. They're not inherently unsafe, but most of them, somebody has gone in and made some changes and done something to probably make something unsafe. So we almost always find problems with those. Insurance companies don't like them. And you can't have modern safety devices installed like arc fault circuit breaker. It's just not an option with fuse panels. So it's always a little bit more concerning if you got fuse panels. We don't see a bunch of those, but they are around every once in a while. Well, okay. So does that cover everything that we're going to talk about with electrical red flags? I I think that's electrical. And really, I think that that was kind of the last topic that we had to talk about for showing red flags. I mean, there's there's other miscellaneous stuff we could get into, but without having photos to show people, that's that's really about as good as we can do talking through it. I want to mention one more time, if you want the full 1.25 1.25 hour class with all of the photos. It's a polished video presentation. You can go to structuretechce.com and you can download that whole class. It, it's like six bucks and some change if you want to download it. And mm-hmm. you don't need to be a licensed real estate agent. You can type in anything you want under the license number. I We would prefer you say not an agent or something like that. So we don't mm-hmm. have to search for your license and you can buy the whole class. Yeah. So, good tip. Good tip. And if you have any questions, they can go to, what was it? Uh, email us podcast at structuretech.com. Perfect. Hopefully we hear from you guys with your questions or thoughts. And if you have any suggestions about other podcast topics, feel free to shoot us some ideas. Yeah. Tessa, you want to close out the show? I know you've been dying to. Okay. All right. Here we go. Without Bill, I cannot replace Bill and his little dogs that always accompany him. But you've been listening to Structure Talk, a Structure Tech podcast production. <laughs> Presentation, whatever. Presentation. Yeah. It's, it's more to the team. <laughs> you can tell we're missing Bill here. But this is Tessa Murray with Ruben Saltzman. And thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time.
For more information on how we can provide you with the right information about your home before you buy or sell, contact us at StructureTech.com.